Just when you think things couldn't get weirder, somehow they do. Do you remember this painting of Barack Obama after his presidency was finished? And it was quite controversial because people noticed that he appeared to have six fingers and no thumb. This looks like his pinky is tucked under four fingers. And this would be his index finger, but if this were his pinky, then this should be his thumb. Well, the other day I was looking at Wikipedia. Uh, for some reason, uh, David Rothschild came across my radar, and so I pulled up his Wikipedia page. He's a, born in 1978. He's fairly young and fairly good looking. And as I looked at his this picture of a Rothschild, uh, I noticed something very strange with the fingers. Very similar to Obama's. Now you can see he has a thumb with his fingers tucked in his pants with his thumb out. That's not unusual. But look how long that thumb is. And then this looks like another thumb, but if you look at it closely, it's not a thumb at all. That looks to be his fourth finger, index finger, and his thumb is tucked behind his index finger, and he only has three fingers tucked in his pants. Which seems very strange, and you can see that they're both the same size, his index and his thumb is the same size. This does not seem to be by mistake or happenstance. This definitely appears to be some sort of inside message. Now everyone is familiar with the Masonic hand grips, and I am too. In fact, I've been in attendance to one or two of these types of rituals and uh, skedaddled after that was not interested. But uh, everyone's aware of the hand grips and that's how they signal each other when they're in a room together. The, um, handshake each other and, and do their little uh, do-dads with their thumb. Like right here, we've got the grip of an entered apprentice, apprentice uh, grip of a fellow craft, and then we've got the real grip of the... Uh, it goes on. You've got, a, you've got a monkey's paw. You've got a rabbit's paw. You probably... Uh, yes, you have a lion's paw. That's across your chest, lion's paw. But, um, and I've seen some other hand signals uh, also done um, but I just thought they were signaling each other who they were. But as I started looking at these fingers and these digit lengths, I started wondering if there was something more to it. Something genetic. This is Queen Elizabeth I, a Tudor queen. She was the daughter of Anne Boleyn and Henry VIII. Now, I recall that Elizabeth I always loved to display her hands in all her portraits. And here you can see these long, long fingers. Again, you can see how she displays them. But there's a particular hand gesture that she does that is very characteristic of Rosicrucianism. And it's this one. It's sort of the opposite of the Star Trek um, hand grip or hand sign. It's with these two center fingers together and the index and the pinky pulled apart. And that is usually representative of a hand signal done by somebody who's in the secret society of a Rosicrucian. See here, right here, his index finger is pulled apart even though his uh, baby finger is not as far apart. But that's normally, they will do their portraits with certain hand gestures. And here's another portrait of her with a more distinct hand gesture showing the two fingers with the outside and the pinky pulled apart. Again, here, it, her showing and demonstrating her long, long fingers. And that is, as I said, characteristic of the secret order of Rosicrucianism. Queen Elizabeth I never had any children. She was the daughter of Henry VIII and Anne Boleyn. And Anne Boleyn, as you recall, uh, was beheaded. By it has been rumored that Queen Elizabeth was 
a hermaphrodite. And that is the reason why she never had any children. Um, it, there's also a story that says that she was actually a boy, but raised as a girl. I think I go more for the hermaphrodite theory. And if that is the case, say she is a hermaphrodite, I am just wondering if this Rosicrucian hand sign indicates that bisexual hermaphroditic character of a particular person. And I do know from reading some of the old treatises, herma hermaphrodites were thought of as being something special during the ancient times. And so it wasn't like today where, where contemporary people think that it is uh, just so repugnant. No, hermaphrodites were considered a blessing from God. So I'm just wondering if this is the reason why they would do these hand signals to signal their special sat status. This is a picture of Joseph Smith, the Mormon prophet. I was raised Mormon and was fairly indoctrinated with the wonderful nature of our prophet Joseph Smith. And I have read some biographies and I do quite admire him in many different ways. Um, he was a very popular man and was very gregarious and people seemed to love him, contrary to how many felt about Brigham Young, the second prophet, who was much sterner. Anyway, imagine my surprise as I am sitting in a room at one of the churches, Mormon churches, and look up at this very famous portrait that many Mormon churches will put in their Relief Society or dining halls of Joseph Smith. And I recognize the Rosicrucian hand sign, like the same hand sign done by Queen Elizabeth. And look how it's propped on his hip. The two fingers, center fingers together, the index and the pinky finger apart. And you place it on the hip. So imagine my surprise. And as you can see, he does have quite a feminine physique here. Now, I'm not saying he was a hermaphrodite. I'm just wondering if this signals a certain type of genetics where they recognized each other. Previously, I introduced you to Akhenaten, who's one of the more famous of pharaohs. He's famous because he created, supposedly, a religion based on monotheism, rejecting all the myriad of gods that the Egyptians worship. But as I told you, when I visited the Cairo Museum, I got a very strange feeling about Akhenaten and his predicament in this new religion, which the Egyptians as a culture did reject and he was forced out of the country and Freud himself has written that he believes Akhenaten is the template for the story of Moses in the Bible but going back to the fact that Akhenaten is reputed for having created this new religion of monotheism it appeared to me when I was at this display of him that he was not willingly at the Armana Temple, that somehow the military, some invading force, had pretty well kidnapped him and forced he and his wife out to the middle of the desert and creating this whole palace very quickly, not done in the normal construction that the Egyptians would do, but a very quick uh, mud brick kind of temple. And they kept him there away from the Egyptian people. So as I said, it just seemed very fishy to me, and even my guide said, yes, it does seem like he was held captive there rather than willingly there with his wife and children. It's Today's topic explores two people, one who really lived and one where we really don't know. The first is Pharaoh Akhenaten, who ruled Egypt for 17 years around 1350 BCE and invented the world's first one-god religion, or monotheism. 
The other is Moses, who millions believe did the same thing around the same time as the founder of Israelite religion, which later morphed into Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. So who were these men, and are they somehow connected? That's what you're about to find out. We'll start with Akhenaten. The son of Amenhotep III and his wife Tii, his original name was Amenhotep as well. When his dad died, Amenhotep IV inherited Egypt and its entire empire at its peak, a superpower running from Nubia, south of Egypt, all the way to Syria. At first, his portrayals make him look like the other kings of the Egyptian empire, young, handsome, and very full of himself. The newly minted pharaoh also inherited Egypt's traditional religion, a spectacular world of sacred texts, myths, and beliefs populated by over 700 gods and goddesses. What you're looking at now is just the A-list superstars. But something happened a few years after Amenhotep IV first sat on the throne. If you were an Egyptian living in his kingdom, you'd think the guy had just plain gone nuts. You'd also think your world was coming to an end. Handsome Amenhotep IV suddenly revealed a very different self. And it wasn't pretty. What's worse, his wife looked just like him, and his kids did too. And he changed his name to Akhenaten, meaning one who was of service to the god Aten. Now, Aten was one of the B-list deities floating around among the 700, the disk of the sun associated with the solar god Ray. But in one staggering command, Akhenaten banned all the deities, their priesthoods, and their power, except for the Aten. There was only one god, and that was that. The many gods were suppressed, and the Egyptian economy, as well as its empire, tanked. For more than a decade, the overwhelming majority of Egyptians lived a nightmare, wondering fearfully what this pharaoh would decree next. But life was short in Egypt, even for royalty. And Akhenaten passed from the scene around 1340 BCE. His religion of the Aten died as well. And the Egyptians tried to recover from the most spiritually traumatic experience of their 2,000 year history so far. The problem was, they didn't. Was there a Moses? Well, if so, who was he? And what did he believe? The problem we face here is simple. To what extent do we accept the biblical texts of faith as fact? I can't answer that one, but for now, let's assume there was a Moses. Could Moses have been a Hebrew slave? The answer is a definite maybe. Canaanite captives, including the mysterious Habiru, perhaps the word that's the basis for Hebrews, we don't know. These people were marched into Egypt by the conquering pharaohs of the era. What about his name? Well, scholars agree that a Hebrew origin for the name Moses is pretty doubtful. It's far more likely that Moses is an Egyptian name, meaning child, like Pharaoh Tutmosis, the child of the god Thoth, or Ramses, the child of the god Re. What did Moses believe about God during his lifetime? Well, again, we can't be sure. But assuming he was a Canaanite slave, he may have worshipped the god El, whose name became one of the names of the god of Israel. If Moses hailed from the Negev, or farther south, he may have worshipped an obscure, invisible desert god of the era known as Yah, whose name may be the same as what we mispronounce as Jehovah. And finally, he may have revered other deities, including the Canaanite goddess Asherah, whom many later Israelites worshipped as Jehovah's wife. But then there's that great Egyptologist Sigmund Freud, who believed that Moses was actually an Egyptian, who worshipped the Aten of Akhenaten. Nice try, but Freud didn't understand how very different Atenism and earliest Israelite religion were. Then there's the problem of when Moses and Akhenaten lived. We know Akhenaten states, we can only guess the dates for Moses, assuming that he actually lived at all. So are Moses and Akhenaten's monotheisms connected in any way? Once again, the clear answer is maybe, and it all has to do with the trauma caused by Akhenaten. After he died, Akhenaten's religion and his name were swept away from the official memory of the state, something very rare in Egyptian history. When he was mentioned, 
his new title was That Criminal of Akhetaten, referring to the name of the capital he built in Middle Egypt practically overnight. But here's the thing. The state removed his memory, but ordinary people seem to have remembered it and developed their own horror stories about an ancient evil king who believed in only one god and tried to kill all the others. In short, monotheism was cursed in Egypt, and anyone who practiced it was evil. Fast forward from the 14th century BC to the 6th. At that time, Egyptians finally started running into a group of people, refugees who had actually fled to Egypt, who believed in only one god. Who were they? What happened to them over the centuries that followed? How is all of this connected to Moses? Well, sadly, my seven minutes are up. So if you want the whole story, take my class on Moses, Akhenaten, and the troubled birth of monotheism. Here he is again in a pose without clothes, and as you can see, very wide hips. Here is Nefertiti, his wife, and she's wearing this large headdress and it appears to be covering a very strange skull and uh, it's a very elongated skull now this is a statue that's supposed to represent what these um, people looked like and so I don't know why they would do this huge skull unless this is how they looked From this display at the Cairo Museum, it appears that there is a very strong indication that the ancient Egyptians were of a different, um, I can't say race, almost a different genus of hominid. Let's just go back to how I viewed this display. This statue of Akhenaten is huge and standing beneath it, I probably came up to, oh, his knees, uh, as I recall. But as you can tell, he has a very masculine face, but look at this round belly and round hips. And then there's breasts here, not large ones, but it's just a very feminine, curvy um, physique. And so when I asked my guide why, in fact, did Akhenaten have this, str this strange feminized physique, my guide told me, well, it was probably some sort of genetic syndrome uh, that they can't really put their finger on. But you know, I was just struck with the fact that Akhenaten might have been a hermaphrodite. And so when I looked for genetic disorders characterized by elongated fingers or an elongated thumb, I came up with Kleinfelder syndrome. And what Kleinfelder syndrome is, it's called the 47 chromosome disorder. It usually affects men, but your gender identity is later discovered after you grow into it. But men are born with two X chromosomes and one Y. So there's an extra X chromosome. And this creates a person who is taller than normal and fingers that are longer than normal. It has additional issues. It, it, there are learning disabilities that are associated with it and a lower IQ, but not very severe so that many men do not even know they go through life with an extra X chromosome. Which brings us back to Joseph Smith long fingers 
and extra long thumbs. This is a photograph that was produced through the Reorganized Church of Jesus Christ Latter-day Saints archives. Now, I would trust them as a historical source. I remember seeing this death mask when I went to BYU in a little kiosk there. It was the first real impression that I had that Joseph Smith was a real person, that he actually existed, rather than the kind of pictures and paintings that I saw of him that always looked a little bit caricatured. I faded in and out various contemporaneous portraits of Joseph Smith kind of give you an idea if this picture matches those. And you can see they're always off slightly angle-wise, so it's hard to see how they compare exactly. But you get a good idea. Of course, there's no way to really substantiate whether or not this photograph is of Joseph Smith. Some people say in this photograph the person is holding a Book of Mormon. There definitely is some similarities in the eyes and the facial structure. Many historians say that the death mask is distorted somehow because Joseph Smith fell to his death from a second story in Carthage jail. Broken bones, possibly. They say that Joseph Smith's nose may have been stuffed with cotton. It may have deformed it somewhat, bulbed it out a little bit, maybe even hooked it over a little unnaturally. Joseph Smith had a bunch of scars from when he was tarred and feathered tore off skin on his temple. He combed his hair forward on that side particularly of his face in order to cover the scar. They say he gained a little weight towards the end of his life. Portly is the description they give of him. Here he's so thin, I don't know what age he would have been if this was his picture. People who saw sculptures based on that death mask said that it seemed somehow that his jaw wasn't strong or pronounced enough in comparison to the real Joseph Smith. The daguerreotype was known for creating almost piercing white rings whenever someone had blue eyes. Joseph Smith had blue eyes. He had piercing blue eyes, auburnish red-brown hair, supposedly. He was described as a handsome, good-looking man, hard worker all through his life, so he was strong, frontiersman. I guess there's no way we'll ever be able to tell whether or not this is Joseph Smith. The church won't officially say it is, and they won't officially say it's not. One thing's for certain, whoever this kid is, he seems like he looks right through you, doesn't he?